welcome to the latest episode of Doorstep History coming this week from the Coffin Works in Birmingham's Jewelry Quarter. Which of course is Sarah's place of work and we'll be finding out exactly why we've come back here again later in the programme. But first of all, last weekend it was the annual Trafalgar Day commemorations in Birmingham's Bullring. And I went along to see what was going to be happening. We may well be 80 miles from the sea, but Birmingham's land-based naval contingent from HMS Forward were very much in evidence as Birmingham continued its long tradition of celebrating Trafalgar Day. That's the nearest Sunday to October the 21st, the day in 1805 when Nelson led the British to naval success against the Spanish and French navies off the southwest coast of Spain near Cape Trafalgar. Nelson's success once again gave the British supremacy over the seas, reopening trade routes with the rest of the world, which had dramatic effects on the economy of the country. Birmingham people were so impressed that the city became the first in the country to raise funds through public subscription to erect a statue in honour of Nelson and his achievements. And that's been in the bullring since 1809. He'd visited uh, Birmingham in 1802. Uh, he'd stayed at the uh, Stiles Hotel uh, in uh, uh, Union Street, which is where House of Fraser now in is. There's a there's a plaque opposite, and uh, people loved him. I mean, though he, he he people in Birmingham during the Napoleonic Wars were starving because obviously uh, Nelson's navy, uh, Napoleon's navy, was uh, blockading Britain, so we couldn't get uh, supplies. So uh, people were starving. So uh, his breaking of uh, uh, the Napoleonic navy meant that food could come into Birmingham. So when he came to Birmingham in 1802, end of August, beginning of September, uh, he'd come from um, Worcester uh, with Sir William Hamilton, his friend of his, and Sir William, Sir William Hamilton's wife, which is obviously also his mistress. So it was an interesting menage a trois. Um, uh, so he came to Birmingham, they were fated, uh, they went to see um, a pl play at the Theatre Royal in uh, New Street and uh, as the Deputy Lord Mayor said in the, his speech the people were so enamoured of Nelson that they unhitched the horses from the carriage and the men pulled him there themselves so he, he, you know I mean this is like you know for whatever hero you have whether it's David Beckham whatever fantastic football supporter the royal family everyone I and mean, he was seen as this demigod sadly was killed. But what that did in terms of Birmingham was that it paved the way for the Navy's supremacy for the next hundred years. And then you think, well, how has that got to do with Birmingham? Well, two things. First of all, there was, uh, there was men on board every ship at, at Trafalgar from Birmingham. So we all, uh, Birmingham, Birmingham men fought in that battle. But in terms of what it means today, Birmingham would not have been allowed, uh, could have become the big uh, merchant trading city that it did become if we couldn't export our goods to all the corners of the world and uh, with obviously the uh, protection of the Royal Navy. So that's what really Nelson did. He set up this supremacy for a hundred years that really enabled Birmingham to become the. We, if there hadn't been Trafalgar and Nelson, the city of Birmingham would not have become the big city it became, so that's why it's important. It's now 50 years since the Aberfan mining disaster in Wales, and as Sarah told me earlier, there is sadly a Birmingham connection. Now, I know the copy works themselves wasn't directly involved with the manufacture of the shrouds etc mm. after the disaster were there but there yeah. is a, a connection here there isn't is, there? There is a connection, the connection is this lady here Elizabeth Weaving who used to make shrouds, she worked in the shroud room here, the sewing room um, but she worked at a company prior to working here called T. Alice Jones and they made the shrouds for that disaster in 1966 and, and she remembers, because we did an oral history a few years back with her and she remembers that the sewing room there when they got the order on that day or just a day after it just went quiet and it wasn't just quiet for a day it was quiet for a whole week mm. and nobody just knew what to say and even on the tea break she said the boss would say come on come on girls but she, they just didn't know what to say at all and it was just silent mm -hmm. and I think you know I, I always say to people on guided tours Norman 
people know where they were if they were old enough to remember it on that day. Was it 21st of October mm -hmm. 1966? Mm -hmm. Yep. And well, of course you remember another yeah. event. Well, 66 was the World Cup, of course, but uh, I think yeah. I'm old enough. I, I was eight. I can remember coming home from school and watching the news. And your mum telling about you. About the disaster. Yeah. And being touched that, in fact, there were so many children of my age that yeah. were actually killed. And mm. that's it. It was only a small place, so a whole generation yeah. wiped out. That's right. Just like so that. So you've got that audio, so let's just have a listen to some of it. And I know when I worked for, uh, for T. Ellis Jones, we did the Aberfan disaster. And for a whole week, we never spoke. It, it happened on a Thursday. I picked up the paper uh, next to where I was working and I ran back to Mr. Jones and I says, uh, have you seen this? I says, I've just picked up the evening mail. He says, what? I says, don't you come from somewhere here? And he says, yes, the next valley. And uh, we got into work the next morning. And he says, uh, could you stop what you're doing? Uh, clear all your machines. Uh, Elizabeth, can you come up and help Will? Uh, it was a woman. Uh, and Graham, we, we've got to get, uh, we've been given the order for Aberfan. And um, he says, uh, you know, we, di we did it all. And uh, for a week we never spoke. We didn't even speak when we had breaks. Because he said, uh, come on, it's break time. We'd say, no, we'll get them out of the way. And uh, at the end of the week he came and he said, uh, thank, thank the Lord, that's over. He says, I'd never want to go through another week like that. He says, it's bad enough for the families. But he says, you, meaning all of us. He says, it was like the grave. And uh, I mean, many times we would uh, stop and have a weep because you were just constantly making children's robes and everything that went with a child's robe. And that was, I mean, it was bad enough when you were doing ones and twos, but when you were doing it in that quantity, it was then that it hit home. So quite poignant there, some of the, the comments that she made, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and as far as we know, Elizabeth's still around. Uh, yeah, and I'm so glad that she was willing to share her memories with us, because it can't be easy to talk about things like that. And th they talk about, don't they, as well, uh, survivor's guilt, the people mm. in, in the valley, yeah. uh, they struggled to survive because, or to, to deal with the fact they survived. Yeah. What, why? So yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think 50 years on, it's really important to mark this anniversary. Yeah, there we are, yeah. So a sad moment there from 50 years ago. Friends, Romans and sick people on their way to hospital all gathered in September 1956 for the unveiling of the reconstruction of a Roman fort at Metchley. Sadly, the reconstruction was quickly damaged, not by rampaging legionnaires, but by bored local youths with too much time on their hands. Well, today the site of the fort is laid out Ramparts can clearly be seen in the area between Birmingham University and the QE Hospital. So I thought I'd have a look. This was one of a number of forts across the Midlands built by the Romans. This one built in about AD 48. It was around AD 200 that the Romans last used this site and it fell into disrepair. But this is what archaeologists think it may have looked like. It's shown here on this impressive leaflet by city planners and architects. The construction included a number of dormitory blocks, food stores and workshops, and the site has been excavated on numerous occasions. Today it's laid out with these plaques and information signs. 
it was around AD 200 that the Romans last used this site and obviously it then fell into disrepair. And today the ramparts around us give us an impression and an idea of where the boundaries of the fort would have been. And if you ever visit the hospital at Queen Elizabeth, it's almost on the edge of the ground. So why not go along and have a look? And we'll have another story from this month in history tomorrow on Big Centre TV. In the meantime, I'm going to go off and see if I can find a few Romans. Blimey, have you seen what the time is? It's X11 past 1B already. So welcome back to the Coffin Works. Now we're heading to the barrelling shop downstairs to hear all about the recent conservation restoration work and to hear about the exciting news about how this will become part of our visitor experience. Those castings are inherently rough when you finish them. They, they always need to have that final finish and they need polishing. Um, all the way through, all the, way through uh, the Coffin Works, even up to the modern days, even with plastics, plastics need finishing. So the finished items were placed in these drums, in these tumbles. Uh, they rotated about 50 revs a minute, uh, driven by the line shaft above us and an electric motor that goes up to the next floor. Yeah. So the pieces were put into the drum uh, with, a type, with some abrasive mediums, sometimes just with water, uh, and they slowly tumbled round. And it's just the act of collision, colliding with each other, yeah. that... Um, uh, Makes them smooth again. Yeah. And the more you put in, the more congested the barrel becomes with, with the components, the less they move. So the collision process is much softer, so they just literally tumble together and you get a very fine finish. If you have less in there, they tend to crash around and the Damn. collision is, 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 is more, more robust. So you, you know, the, the, the process is far more robust. The Coffin Works has just celebrated its second anniversary. So what plans have they got for the future? Well, we're constantly trying to uh, reinvent ourselves and, and, and introduce new things for uh, visitors, visitors to the Coffin Works. Um, what we've got lined up this year and for our second anniversary is to open a whole new gallery which is going to be based on the Newman Brothers trade show stands, the stands that they took round to, to the trade shows with all their finest coffin handles and fittings and where they could see where the royal family used the coffin fittings and so on. So we'll be having that. But in, in addition, uh, not just that, but we help to have our barrelling shop, which is being repaired right now, being conserved right now, working barrels from the barrelling shop will be a completely new feature. It's a whole new room uh, in, the, in the museum as well, so a new gallery, a new room. And then we've been working uh, hard over the past few months uh, on a guidebook. Uh, lots of people want to take away a guidebook and find out more about the Coffin Works. We've got some wonderful uh, stories we've been collecting, research has been done, so we feel the time is now ready to, uh, to to write the guidebook and that's what we're doing so on the uh, it's going to be the 4th of November we're going to have a big relaunch of the coffin works uh, where the gallery the new gallery will be open the guidebook will hopefully be on sale the barreling shop people will be able to see so really expanded a new experience for visitors to the to the museum now at the moment we for the first two years we've still held a five-star rating from uh, TripAdvisor people are coming to love it so and we we're still rated as one of the top attractions in Birmingham, even if you haven't heard about us. So we're going to get even better. And that's the aim, try and get even better, continue to work at it. Now we're moving off now to the Black Country and we're going to look at the Spake project again. Looking at how dialect has changed over the years in towns across the Black Country. And this week we're looking at some words that are spoken in Cradley Heath. Um, and this one, chuggling, is just like absolutely amazing word. I, I, I forgot about that because my younger brother was probably the noisiest eater that I'd know, and I, he always used to sit next to me and always had to stop blooming chuggling because he was the noisiest person I know. You ask him about faggots and pies, and some folks don't know what they've been. You some folks don't. Um, still I still make faggots. And you still make like and they pineapple upside the, down cake and fruit cake. They used to have brains and eggs. Especially if you was pregnant, they'd give you brains and eggs. They'd say it was all the good food that is had their brains and eggs. That was pig's brains 
and a baldy. And I can... Snap for breakfast, put your own snap up. Oh. My dad always said, if you put your own snap up, you're caught moaning. Because, <laughs> like, blokes before now, they used to throw the... The sandwiches, they'd open it up, they'd say, oh, Riley salmon again, which would be a cheese sandwich, and they'd throw it in the foyer. Don't want that. So, so if you put your own snap up, you call moan about it. Water pudding, fagus and peas, chitlins, yeah. Rabbit stew. Rabbit stew, oh, rabbit stew is gorgeous. Pig's head. Oh, pi- my dad used to make chaw, used to get chaw, the pig's yeah. head. Used to get the pig's head, and he'd say, leave the tongue in. And uh, it, uh, leave it the poorly. eyes in, see it through the wick. Oh, I'll well, leave the eyes in, I'll see it through the wick, I'll see it through the wick. That's what they used to or say. See, see it through the wick. My, my mother went to the butchers and they asked him if he got any pig's feet. He says, No, it's the way I stand. It's the way I stand. Because oh. <laughs> I said, You got any pig's feet? He says, No, it's the way I stand. And chitlin. Oh, that's my favourite, chitlin. You can't get that anyway, you know. You go go to a proper old fashioned butcher's. Hey, I've been fancying some of that for ages. And since he's closed down in the market, I can't get none. I mean, nephew said there's a shop up there that the butchers he sells it, so I'm going to go and fetch me some from up there. Did you Mind do- you, I claimed him one out once. Because my father always killed pigs on a Christmas for the, give their legs of pork to the old folks' homes. And I claimed the chicken out, and I thought, oh, I'm going to, oh, I couldn't date it after. Hey, no. It's, it tells all the muck, though, it tells all the poo. And you've got to get the, the long thin ones, you've got to get a stick in them and turn them inside out to wash them. I couldn't, I claimed them, but I couldn't take it after. Not that one. They turned me off chitlin, but I couldn't take no, that no. Well, actually, liquor, liquor is a black country sound, but it means the fat on the... Yeah, on the on, on the, the beef. Beef, that's liquor. one, your mum uses that, because he used to get the, years ago, they used to get the bread and, and dip it in the liquor. And yeah. Used to, mom, your mum used to say that. Yeah, the liquor, it's the fat on the beef. And seriously, now, honestly, what they used to eat was just ridiculous. Things my mum tells me I used to eat as a kid, I'm like, oh uh, my god. Well, uh, they have like brains and eggs, and like pork dripping and, and beef dripping on toast, and they're still biting it. She says on the, the lid, it's got lovely on toast, spread yeah. faggots, oh, and then to salt and pepper on it, yeah. faggots and pies, groats. And my mum says they like, they used to like, oh, a, my mum says like, they used to have pigs in the garden. And like the, not the keep them for so long, and they used to kill them and slaughter them. They used to eat them. And it also told me about when when they used to have eels. And the, I used to buy eels for my granddad, and he, he used to get them in the garden. He used to get the skins off them in the, and skin out all the eels in the garden. Like they used, honestly, and then and, and, and like people people would come round, we like selling stuff. Like they used to buy jugs of it. Like my mum would go like and buy like him like a jug of beer, or and people would come in selling stuff in the streets that you couldn't. And like my mum said, like, I think my mum said like she was something like eight or nine before when she, the first time she ever saw a banana. Oh. She couldn't believe what, she didn't know what a banana was. And they used to have like, like two a month or something ridiculous and my mum used to share it with Uncle John, my mum's younger brother. Because my mum was like one of, my mum was one of seven children, so. Now before we go, we've just got time to bring you up to date on the tree of Broad Street. You may recall that last week we revealed that the 140 year old tree is in fact probably only about 80 years old, but protesters still think it should be saved. And one of the most visual people in Birmingham when it comes to protests is John Egan, uh, uh, Ray Egan, who many of you will know as uh, John Bull. Any tree in this city should be saved, in my opinion. But as regards cutting it down, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't accept that. It just, that's not on. I mean, we love our trees in Brum. And, uh, and, and rightly so. And uh, we're going to battle to save it. And I tell you what, when push comes to shove over this tree, if the pairs of bees start doing anything to that tree, I'm going to be up there and do a swampy on it. I will, I will, oh yes. I, I, I feel that mad about it, you know, that uh, they can even think of cutting it down. I mean, and I've sheltered onto that tree many times in the rain. And a very special tree to me, and uh, we're, we're going to fight tough and down to keep it anyway, that's my... But uh, God save our tree. So this is what the protesters think. Now, this has raised so many issues in the City Council that the Deputy Leader of the Council, Ian Ward, has spoken exclusively to Big Centre TV on his latest thoughts about the tree. So we've got this ongoing controversy over the tree, so it may not be 140 years old after all, so I think it's probably around 80 years old, but protesters will still say it's still an old tree, so it should still be kept. 
Yes, uh, yeah, it's an old tree and that's obviously important. What we've been looking at is the design of the metro station and the design of the new square to see if the tree can be accommodated. Uh, in terms of the square, we'd have to redesign some of the security features and the water feature in particular, and that would make it very unlikely we could accommodate the big wheel and the ice rink over Christmas and New Year if the tree stays. But we're still looking at uh, whether uh, other redesigns might be possible in order to accommodate the tree. Although I would have to say that uh, the square itself in its redesign will, will, will be planting uh, many many more new trees in this square than there are currently so there will be an overall gain in the number of trees but as you say it's an 80 year old tree so we need to think carefully before we take it out. And the tree story of course is one that's continuing to grow and grow and no doubt in the news and in our future programmes we'll update you on the latest progress. Now if you've enjoyed what you've seen on Doorstep so far, then please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. You can contact us on Twitter at Big Centre TV, Facebook look for Big Centre TV or you can email us hello at bigcentre.tv Well that's about all we've got time for this week from the Coffin Works. And we'll be back next week, as usual, looking at people and places that have had a historic impact on the West Midlands. As usual, thanks for watching. Yeah, goodbye.